everybody, and welcome to Vassals of King's Grave, an offshoot of an offshoot of a podcast of Ice and Fire, a long rest running show dedicated to George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire, and occasionally Game of Thrones, which is a very absurdly long introduction, but one that's probably more fitting today because we are actually discussing the whole concept of whether you should or shouldn't watch the show, what happens when you watch it belatedly. <laughs> My name's Bina007, I'll be your host today, and I am joined by Nadia. Hi everyone, this is Nadia, aka Mama Wolf from the Days of Wolfcast, and Michal. Hey everyone, Ink as Rain on the forums. Oh, so lovely to podcast with you girls again. So the reason for this whole podcast, this episode of Oc, is that Nadia and I were long-time holdouts from watching the show after season four and eventually caved whereas Mikhail carried on watching all the way through because you are just so active in podcasting and the shows and pop culture in general so I want to talk a little bit about the whole decision of whether to watch and not to watch and how that impacts the fan community before we actually get into our impressions and reasonings for why we finally watch so Mikhail and Nadia why did you originally decide to or to not watch at the end of season four because that seems like the natural breaking point for lot of people right like it's partly partly my job you know I, I cover game of thrones um also i i just like i like talking about pop culture stuff um and game of thrones is such a big part of that and like you know the idea of like not doing the vox was like very upsetting to me um and i just kind of like i wanted to keep going um i was also partly hoping that they wouldn't spoil quite as much as they um would uh and they did and they did a lot um but yeah you know at the end of the day I also think like I'm this is a newer a newer thing for me but I'm ultimately pretty pessimistic about getting the book getting Winds of Winter certainly getting the end of the series so for me it's kind of like well you know I remember these things but even now I'm trying to like make a list and be like what did you guys think of XYZ and I'm like it's taking me a little while to, yeah. to rem- remember all the big things that happened so if we do get it like obviously nothing's gonna shock me like the red wedding but then again the red wedding wasn't a shock for me either because my sister told me about it which is a good thing because i would have given up <laughs> on the book so when you say that um, you thought they weren't wouldn't spoil so much stuff is that because you thought you might have had a new book by now or... yeah i think it was a combination i think season five which which was the one before which george wrote this like long depressing mia culpa about how he couldn't get the book out and he felt really depressed about it and really sad and that was just like well, now I feel like garbage forever, <laughs> like, you know, criticizing the man. But before season five or six, he he wrote something like that. And at that point, it was just sort of like, you know, I'm along for the ride and I can, I'm too immersed ultimately in pop culture circles. I follow too many people on Twitter who watch Game of Thrones. Like it was either going to be either I watch it myself or I'm going to be spoiled. So I might as well just like go along and be able to fully participate in the outrage. No, I, I get <laughs> I that. I that. definitely get that. So Nadia, you obviously took the opposite decision. I remember us talking about it on Wolfcast, realizing that the show was going to overtake the book and like shit what are we going to do next season are we going to do Wolfcast and realizing a lot of us weren't going to do it so do you want to talk the listener through your reasoning for giving up I think my my reason wasn't that I didn't enjoy the show anymore which I think some people did you know they thought that it was becoming too fan fictiony for them it wasn't like that for me I I at the end of season four that was the first time when it started to kind of move the some of the storylines began to move beyond what we've seen in the book in Bran's storyline I mean it, it it wasn't the end of Bran's storyline in the book but I think at the end of season four in the very last episode Jojen died yep. and then back in season three when um, Lisa who doesn't even exist in the book she died um, but the thing was that we have spent uh, in you know in podcasting to be okay we spent so many hours theorizing about you know uh, the, the fates of some characters then to suddenly have the final conclusion that oh you know it doesn't matter she's gonna die or he's gonna die or you know there, there's nothing nothing's going to come of this that just kind of I don't know, ruins it for me a little bit. So I I wanted my first opinion of the story to be from the author's point of view, not from the show, which is why I stopped watching it. Yeah, I think I'm exactly the same as you, actually. I was never as much... I mean, I think a lot of people got very down on the show. And Mimi, most famously, right from Podcast of Ice and Fire, bowed out in season two before it was fashionable. I still enjoyed it for what it was, even the bits that I didn't like as much. But it was more just because I wanted to read it first. And I think I had this very convinced opinion that it it would be okay. It would only be like a year or a year and a half, and then I'd catch back up with everyone else. So it didn't oh, seem yeah. like it didn't seem like such a 
a big sacrifice because I thought it was only maybe a season and a half. I think I was just a sweet summer child. And then the other thing was that maybe I wasn't as in, although I was involved in the, the wolf cast, I wasn't as invested, Mikhail, as you were in the wider fandom. So I felt it was something I could just, you know, mute those channels for the period of the show and, you know, keep up with other stuff, which proved probably more successful than I had anticipated. So... Yeah, it was it wasn't a hard decision. It was kind of weird when everyone was doing the cast and not being part of them, but it was cool, you know. Got to podcast on different stuff with different people. So, what changed your mind, Nadia, and are you happy that you did? It, I think it started with the novellas. As when Princess and the Queen came out, we were all so thrilled to have something new from George. And we were all so excited. And I think the podcast we had was for I I, I don't know, we had like 10 people or 12 people on one podcast. Right? Yeah, it was and crazy then, and it could easily have been more, right? <laughs> yeah. And then the next one came out, The Rope Prince, and we weren't quite as excited as four, but that was okay. And then Sons of the Dragon came out and I don't think any of us even considered doing a podcast. I haven't that. even read it. And I feel just, bad. I'm such a bad fan. Yeah. No, no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't read it. Like, it, it's basically word from word taken from World of Ice and Fire. I mean, there are maybe like one or two extra details that we get. Oh, that really? Know, but it's, oh, yeah. It's like mostly all in World of Ice and Fire, which is the first thing that made me really angry. Huh. Um, and then, you know, uh, when George first came up with the idea of this GRR Marillion, um, and he said, oh, but that will be like after the TV's done. And then I'll write these, this compendium about the Targaryens and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly fire and blood is coming out and there's still no sign of him getting there. Yeah. And, you know, and then I realized that uh, we might never get the books, but, you know, the final season of the show is coming soon. And, you know, I've enjoyed this for so many years. And if this is the only conclusion that I'm going to get, I want to enjoy it at the same time as you know, all my friends and family. Were, yeah, I think who that makes a lot of sense. I mean, for me, it was the same, right? It was this, it was this kind of slowly dawning conviction based not on really any facts, just gut instinct that we're never getting another book. And then it's like, well, I may as well watch the TV show because the whole logic of waiting for him to tell me first goes. And also just every April, my best friend Kiri and I go on a sort of Game of Thrones road trip and we were coming up onto our Iceland trip. And, um, you know, she's always complaining that she can't talk to me about the show. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to burn through it and watch it before that and get through it and I did so there we go I have to say I think the last straw for me was you caving in I know I'm not sure how much you 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 know that you were really like the the bulwark against the show on the forums like I think people didn't spoil it because they didn't want to piss you off and like now it's like oh anything goes you know like oh who cares everything's out it's ah I feel sad for that because lots because I think lots of people in the forums Forums are still waiting to the end, so um, people should definitely still abide by the spoiler thing because lots of people are still not watching the show. So I feel sad if that's if that's not being a bulwark anymore. So Mikhail, like you're more plugged in maybe to the wider sort of off fuck fandom, but is this a trend? Are there lots of people who were holdouts who were caving as we get towards the final season? Do you pick that up in the fandoms, or do you think it's still basically there are the show watchers, the book lovers, and they're pretty much in their own lanes, and that's not really changing much? I mean, I think they are pretty much in their own lanes because I I feel like anybody who you know, retained an interest. Like Mimi is not interested in the show. <laughs> you know, she's not going to watch it because she doesn't care. So anybody, I think, who retained that interest. I, I mean, I, I I don't know. Like my brother, my brother still hasn't seen the show, and like like his eyes turn dark and his brow contracts every time I bring up like anything related to Sunquest and Fire. <laughs> He's like, "Is this anything about the show?" And I'm like, "Oh God, I don't even know at this point." Maybe the people who have always been devoted, like primarily more to the books. That's not what I mean to say because I consider myself deeply devoted to the books. I think the people who were always suspicious of the show, I should say, maybe left a while ago. Whereas people like you guys who we're doing it kind of for the preservation of the book, but not really against the show are sort of breaking away. But I mean, you know, at this point, like the end is in sight. So like, I feel like maybe last season more people did that because it was, you know, season six and or season seven last last year. Uh, we're in the home it's, stretch. It's, yeah, exactly. But, you know, it's it's very, the show is bigger than the books. I think we have to like. Oh, by far, right? By far. Yeah. I mean, they like are going to be the definitive thrones. storytellers now. So exactly. Whether exactly. we like it or so not. I think... Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah. overall, I think this has been good for the fandom, even though it's deeply traumatic for most for for those of us who have like, you know, been here for a long time, 
because we are mainstream and we are something that people recognize. So I think that, you know, it would it would be too bad to be totally bitter about it. But, it, you know, I think we just have to be realistic. Yeah. I mean, I never I, I never got the whole kind of Dragon Demand style sort of show hatred where it sort of, you know, you have this real bitterness towards it. I, I just don't get that bit. You know, it is, I can't, I, I am sad. I'm melancholy. I'm melancholy for George. I feel it slipped away from him. But that's, that's not D&D's fault. He did the deal. So it is what it is. Yeah. So, so Nadia, are you happy that you watched? Are you happy that you didn't watch? Do you think now I should have just watched all along? Or are you happy that you watched in a kind of calmer on your own, away from the craziness kind of way? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think it was easier to stay away from borders when you just, like, avoid social media for a couple of months every year. Um, if it had been, like, you know, oh, yeah, I'm going to watch the episode tonight or the next day and I have to avoid spoilers constantly, I have to avoid talking to everyone, that, I think, would have been more difficult <laughs> to avoid spoilers, in a way. I agree. Um, but, you know, doing it this way, everyone everyone around me knew that I wasn't watching the show and I didn't want to get spoilers. So everyone was, like, really super nice. Everyone was very careful if I'm not get spoilers. Um, were you, in retrospect, did, were you spoiled on anything at all or anything major when you came oh, to yeah. watch it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, there was one spoiler that I got. Um, and that was accidentally spoiled by my cousin who does who hasn't read both or watched the show. Um, <laughs> and she just, she'd seen, she'd seen something on Facebook or something and she mentioned it. And then <laughs> uh, I, I kind of guess. That was the one kind of line of argument I never got. I remember sort of Vic kind of taking the piss at me when I decided to start watching, like, how you, you'll just get spoiled. It's stupid. You can't, like, hold the tide. And I, and I always used to find that a little bit patronizing. Like, all I need to do is mute Twitter and Facebook for eight weeks a year. It's not a big deal. But I want to give um, a yeah. massive thank you to everyone in this community who was so careful around all of us who weren't watching the show. I mean, I literally did not have a single spoiler from seasons five through seven, which is testament to everyone in the VOC and the podcast Vice and Fire community. But in particular, people like sort of White Raven and Varley and No True Lady who would literally be, okay, Bina, just make sure you stay off any kind of internets today because something big happened yesterday people are pissed off and I'll be like okay <laughs> so I, I just really <laughs> want to say it's testament to the loveliness of Vok that um, people really respected decisions on either side of that divide in general I feel and were really helpful so I, I did stay unsullied and I'm glad I did it that way I have to say I'm glad I watched it on my own away from the hype I think there are things that if I had watched them week by week in the Vok community I would have gotten far more pissed off about than I did and also there's something about binge watching it like you know, there's not the time to get pissed off about something because you're just on to the next episode. So you're just like, meh. Whereas if you had a whole week oh, to yeah. get traumatized about it and whipped up into a fury, I think I watched it in a much more sort of zen, calm way. And I remember like when I was coming up to certain episodes because I was like vo- um, on the podcast of Ice and Fire forums, like commenting on each episode. I-, I kind of felt that people were disappointed I wasn't angrier about stuff, especially stuff relating to Sansa because I'm such a Sansa fan. <laughs> and I was like, Casey was like, I thought you'd be more angry about this. And I was like, well, no, actually I'm pretty, like I wouldn't have started watching uh, if I wasn't I- I already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's kind of like the nature of the beast. Like if I were in a place where I was going to get angry about departures from the books or if I was in a place to get angry, I wouldn't be watching. Like, it's kind of like, it's almost the mm. prerequisite of me going back to watching this is that I'm very calm about book versus show. So to me, it's just, it's a fanfic and it's a really nicely produced one, but I'm not going to get my knickers in a twist about it. But I think it's the way to do it. So Nadia, will you watch uh, the final season along with everyone else? Or will you wait till it's over and then oh. a couple of months and then watch it on your own? Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. I, I actually, you know, the one thing that I did miss was, you know, if there was something that I didn't particularly enjoy, I could always rant about it later on, you know, WordCast or whatever. And I, I totally plan on doing that for the final season because it's going to be a lot. Oh, okay, so good. <laughs> I, I'm totally going to do it. <laughs> Whereas I'm actually going to try and do what I did this time, which is not watch it with you all, wait a couple of months and then just watch it on my own, which may or may not. I might cave in. I don't know. But that's the end. I just think it's a much more generous to the show way of watching it. You guys are so angry. I don't know. <laughs> oh, so, so... I, I totally hear that. But also, like, 
Yeah, this is TV history, you know? Like, don't you want to be a part of that? Like, the final, this is the most watched show <laughs> in television history. Like, don't you want to be a part of that at the end? Also, yeah, being angry is kind of fun. <laughs> I don't know, I'm pretty so chill. I'm pretty chill. I mean, I didn't nice watch... Like, I, I didn't watch The Wire when it was airing, so I watched that in my own time. Sopranos, like, famous finale episode. I watched that out of sync with everyone else. I'm, I'm pretty okay with it. And, you know, you have to remember, I'm like, I'm off Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and everything now so it's kind of like I'm, I'm pretty detached from life I'm so much happier so <laughs> I think that's probably it's probably a good thing especially judging by how crazy ball season seven was I think it's just good for me to be in my own space so then Nadia have you gone back and listened to any of the old uh, dragon casts and wolf casts and kraken casts for the seasons that well, I just missed? finished watching a couple of weeks ago so I probably will go back and listen to some of them particularly you know in episodes that I don't like where I really don't agree with the decision the showrunners went. Vicarious and anger. I probably, I'll probably, exactly. I'll probably go back just to listen to um, discussions on that. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, and then before we get into sort of the changes and what we liked and didn't like, maybe just another more general one, maybe more at Mikhail as well. Is this the first time we've had like a major fandom where there's been a split like this? And do you think it's had any discernible or particular impact on the VOC, not the VOC community, just the community in general, or maybe VOC in particular, I don't know. I mean, I suppose VOC in particular wouldn't have the reread without it, because that was a, a non-show space, a safe space for people who, and a place for us to podcast together, because we don't have shows to podcast about, but is this like a, a thing? I wonder if in future people will look back at sort of other you know, fantasy fandoms and think this was a very interesting one because of how it all got paced out. Yeah, I mean, I'm honestly fascinated by this particular phenomenon. I don't, I think there have been, I was actually on a panel about this at Con of Thrones, which was a lot of fun. Um, we were all kind of like turning gray as we were <laughs> talking about it. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think that there have been maybe some like anime or, um, you know, other other things that have existed um, where, you know, the, the, the rights have been sold and the story has continued beyond like the original print um, version, but not definitely not on the scale. Like Harry Potter obviously was long done, um, even though they didn't they, like it started before the series was over, but they they finished the series um, long before the final movies came out. Obviously, Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I, I, I think that this is very kind of unique and it is kind of also tied into George so it's like at the center of it all we have this like irascible you know old man in New Mexico you know um who's who's like everybody kind of wants to discern his you know psychology and and physiology to be honest but you know I I think it's it has definitely made an impact I think that there are a lot of I mean you have a whole range of people right you have the people who are just show watchers you have the people who are just book readers and have never you know seen the show or only seen like individual scenes and then you have the whole gamut in between and I think in that you have a whole span of like people who are bitter people people who have you know taken advantage of the prominence of the show and run with it like you know like history of Westeros and radio Westeros like those guys have become prominent in the fandom because they started talking about Game of Thrones you know they weren't as famous when they were just talking about A Song of Ice and Fire and and like good on them I love what they do they do great work so I think you know I, I do think that there are a lot of divisions, even just at, at Con of Thrones, actually, which is obviously called Con of Thrones. So that tilts you a little toward the show. There were definitely panels where people were like, I hate, I hate what they did in the show. <laughs> like, this is so frustrating. And then you had ones that were like, we're just talking about the show here. Like, we're not yeah. actually going to delve into the repercussions in the book. So I think it's a very wide range, ultimately. And I, I actually am fascinated to see what happens to the fandom when the show is over, because I don't think we're going to have another book at that point so we will contract so what will we contract into you know i overall i think it will be good because like i mean people we know and love on Vok, like casey you know came through the show you know so we we i think as a fandom are definitely richer for it um it'll just be interesting to see how we metamorphose once again yeah i'm, I'm, fascinated. I'm, I'm fan- fascinated by that too i don't get hating the show it's just a show don't watch like honestly like, seriously <laughs> It's this employing so a lot of people. Of <laughs> it's generating a lot of money. It's it's just a it's just a show. Like there's there's big important shit going on in the world that you can get angry about. This this honestly isn't it. I do wonder where this community is going to go. Partly because it's the first 
probably major fantasy show that's happened truly in the age of the internet with everything going on around it. And I feel there'll be like, you know, PhDs written about this in like 10 years time, sort of analyzing, <laughs> you know, like I've, I've read sort of like um, sort of academic essays about the original Twin Peaks show and how that started off at the start of the sort of the um, alt news groups on the early internet and people going back and looking at how that impacted how people analyze the show. So, yeah, I think it's fascinating. I think it's it's so bound up in the future of Vok and the future of our podcast of Ice and Fire that, um, yeah, it's going to be fascinating. But I have caved. Nadi has caved. So we're here today. Let's get into the differences between the show and the book and what we liked and what we didn't like. So for all of you out there, you know, last warning, this is going to be spoilerific for everything, um, particularly seasons 537, because that's where we both picked up and joined back in. Um, so, Nadia, what was, and actually Mikal, if you can still remember, what was your biggest positive surprise of the TV show, seasons five through seven? You know, what was the scene or the set piece or the character that you thought, you know what, they, they're making this up now, this is fanfic, but I love what they're doing with this, they get it, and this this is really impressing me, and I love this. I never thought I would like any of the, of the Tardies other than Sam. The show really made, made me, you know, like, I actually like um, Randall Tardy. I always <laughs> like, like Randall Tardy. I, he didn't he didn't get that particular line from the book, you know, where he says to the end that you need a good hard draping. So that's <laughs> probably one of the reasons. Um, but yeah, sure, Randall Tardy and Dick and Tardy, they're both pretty, you know, decent guys. And I, I did not think I would like them, but I did. I think for me, it was the set pieces. I loved Hard Home. Battle of the Bastards. I thought this is where, yeah. you know, oh, yeah, this is where good. HBO can do it, right? They can just throw millions at something and make it look amazing, which, you know, I'm lazy. My imagination is not as good as HBO. So Hard Home, I just thought was superb. Yeah. And then even things like, I don't know, some of the character stuff, obviously, is where it falls down. But I really loved the whole sequence around the death of Hodor and discovering that whole hold the door thing. I thought it was so powerful and emotional. And I was just sitting there thinking, how does George write this better than that? How does George make me feel more than this? Um, that would be intimidating for me as a novelist, even if it was my original idea, which I'm sure it was, to think, how do I create something that's more resonant than that? I mean, that just blew me away. Um, Mikhail, how about you? What are the things that now, looking back on it with a bit of distance, what are the things that you really admire in how they brought 537 to screen? The final episode of season uh, six, I thought was genuinely tremendous. Uh, I, I thought that, you know, that's the one where the, the, she blows up the sept and everything. Uh, I, I was like on the edge of my seat. My heart was in my throat. I thought everything from the music to the writing, um, obviously the acting, that's never a problem in Game of Thrones, was superbly done. Like that was genuinely something where I was like, this is this is monumental. and Good TV. Um, exactly. And it made me accept some things that I was not happy about. Like I, I'm not happy that Marjorie died, but like the way they did it, I, I could accept it. Which reminds me, I also love the High Sparrow. Like, I, I know we haven't seen a lot of him in the book, but he was like, I was kind of, you know. Uh, yeah, Jonathan Price was some I great casting. Could probably make, you know, religious fanatic pretty easily. <laughs> so convincing. <laughs> I also have to say, I did like, I mean, season five was pretty brutal on some characters, just getting rid of them, but I quite admired the concision of it. Just, yeah, you know what? It's really boring having Brienne trudge around trying to find Sansa. Let's just get them together really super quick. And let's just get rid of, you know, I was kind of like really shocked when they got rid of people like Barris and Selmy, but I could see, and Mance, and I could just see what they were doing. They were just trying to sort of clear away the decks a little bit like George has so many spinning plates it's like let's just get rid of some of these spinning plates and then go into the final furlong and just wrap this show up so there was a kind of brutal kind of logic to some of the stuff they did that it was jarring to see the pace of it but I was like okay I get this this is a show um, I get that this has to be done. So I was kind of at peace with it. I think they, started, they transferred some of Brienne's storyline to Sandor Clegane. Yeah. Um, which was a nice way to get him back into the story. Because in the books, he's pretty much gone, right? But this is... Uh, this is... Unless he comes back for Clegane Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then before we get into the sort of, you know, we can do a season by season, but what was your biggest negative surprise of the show? So, Mikhail, like, what were people really pissed off about? What were you pissed off about? And you were surprised I wasn't. <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely. It was the marriage of Ra- of Sarah, of, I'm mixing, um, of Sansa to Ramsey and her, uh, her raping for the rest of the season. Um, and the way that that plot line ended. And I mean, that entire thing, like still honestly makes me very upset. I don't think it was well done. I don't think it was well considered. 
I don't think it was necessary. But she's going to get raped yeah. in the books, right? I mean... I don't know. I don't know about that. I, 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 the, the line that they had said, that the that D&D had said at, at the point when it came out, was that they had this arc in mind for Sansa for several seasons. Like, and, and it was leading up to that, which to me was baffling um because uh, here, here's the thing it's not necessary well okay i don't know that i personally would ever have been okay with sansa getting raped by ramsey i'm not i'm not sure that i ever would have however i do think that there were ways that they could have made this more palatable she her whole arc that season is like gaining power you know she comes down the stairs as like dark raven sansa you know at the end of season four and it's like all powerful and that in that very episode she's like oh this is my home you can't scare me and then she just gets raped you know she doesn't try and you know like mitigate anything Ramsey's doing she doesn't you know it's all about Theon's reaction ultimately she has no agency throughout the entire season like even their escape is all Theon I, I found it colossally disappointing and honestly like it's possible that it will happen similarly with Harry the Air in, in the books I can't see George doing it quite that lazily honestly like it oh, was a hang, very on, hang on hang on hang on hang <laughs> on I mean like come on we have litigated at depth about how George is basically quite a sort of ham-fisted writer of scenes of sexual license so, I, I think it's very possible I mean it just comes but, but off you don't think I think it's pr- like well, if, if you're referring to like the the Jamie Cersei scene like I totally agree that's like uh, a mess but I don't think that he would approach a scene where he was like I'm writing a rape scene in that way like the way he he taught you know Danny Danny doesn't have like explicit rape scenes in in the first book but like when when Drogo's coming to her night after night and she's like it's like she's biting her pillow so she doesn't scream in pain that is a very vivid very sad part of her story so I, I don't think that he would approach like deliberately writing a rape scene in that way especially not from Sansa's point of view you know we're in Jamie's point of view when that bizarre scene happens okay so let's get into season five then of which this is a big storyline so in season five just a very super quick bullet point summary in Essos you've got um Danny marries his star she exiles Jorah she makes oh, his star. Be that guy completely. she flies away on Drogon at the watch you've got hard home the assassin nation sam gets laid you've got the death of aemon the north uh little finger marries off sansa she's raped re- re- rescues her not my stannis r.a.p Celise. brienne is revenged on stannis in king's landing you've got the rise of the faith militant the walk of shame in dawn you've got Bron, Bron and jamie's dawnish road trip r.a.p Marcella. aria training montage she kills Merrin trent and goes blind so that's that season five so within that you're right i think the sansa thing is the thing that's big okay so help me out because i'm genuinely trying not to be obtuse here but to me, the thing that kind of annoyed me in this whole storyline is I didn't understand the psychosexual motivation of Littlefinger giving up Sansa to Ramsay, even for so to say political gain in some way. He's got the, he's got the iry, he's got Sansa who he's ma- he fancies, and that whole thing just seemed weird to me. Like suddenly he's yeah. allying with Ramsay. So that's the thing that made me angry. That just didn't make any sense to me. The concept that Sansa yeah, what does he get he gets nothing. It makes no sense, right? So what the, does the, he get out of it? Nothing. And then so that made me angry. But the idea that Sansa like her getting raped on her wedding night is nothing to do with whether or not she's become this kind of emo goth Elaine in season four. It's Ramsay's going to do that regardless. I thought it was actually handled okay insofar as they don't show it graphically, which is respectful. You know, they show it from Reek's reaction because that's, I think, just a gentler way of showing it, maybe. And I kind of, I loved her character thereafter that she becomes this very sort of hard cruel almost cruel in reaction to it you know that gets rid of every shred of romance she ever had and I just didn't I I think I'm missing something because I'm not getting angry enough about it it genuinely just struck me as a really well acted storyline and I didn't mind Reek rescuing her and I just thought she becomes this badass Sansa 2.0 afterwards and when she talks about it she's talking about it I think with John or someone she says you know he really hurt me and I don't mean he sort of you know he hurt my my romantic heart I can still feel him doing things to me like you know there is due uh thought to her trauma and i don't know mikhail help me or nadia like wh- where do you fall between me and mikhail and our reactions to this yeah what what do you think nadia i'm, I'm interested yeah i think i agree with bina i i don't agree with how the storyline came about like i little think i had a very clear plan on how he planned to keep on controlling Santa, right because that's the one thing he doesn't want to let go he wants to have cats 
tried, and this is the only way he's ever gonna have her. Going to let Santa go willingly. His entire plan of you know having her marriage to an annulled and then marrying her off to Harry Harding, and then arranging a convenient death for Harry Harding, and then you know it goes on from there. But it basically his entire plan rests on being the doll of Santa, right? Yeah, exactly. Why would he give it up to this complete stranger he knows nothing about? Yeah, and this. I mean, the the reason why he like the reason why he did that is because they wanted to have Santa get raped by Ramsey. Yeah, so that's like exactly. stupid writing. Even in the show, it it doesn't make sense even in the show. Like giving Santa away to Ramsey, he loses con- whatever control he had over her by through which he also lose control of the North, right? Which was why he he took and hid Santa. Um, and I mean, he's basically declared to the whole world that he has her. Um, and that's just stupid. Like. Why so how do you feel, Nadia, about the specific thing about how the rape is depicted or the aftermath of it, which is what Mikhail seems to be more objecting to? Is um... Yeah, I was actually fine with it because if you look at the book, it's basically the exact same thing that happens to Jane. So it doesn't really matter if it's, ha- it's happening to one female character or the other, as harsh that sounds, because we don't have that emotional connection to Jane that we have to Santa. So I think it makes more sense for her to be in that particular scene. If they've, you know, forced her into that storyline, then, you know, we can't have, we can't change the dancer's character. And I think it's fine because we didn't actually see the rape scene. Like, like Bina said, it wasn't graphical. It was more the reaction to it. So okay, I, Mikhail, I think... what are we missing? Because, I like to think we're sensitive, <laughs> yeah, exactly. right on sisters <laughs> and feminists. Like, like, what, like, what are we not getting? And no, I think this no, is a I classic mean... example. I think of watching this on your own and not in in the hive mind. But yeah, preach. No, absolutely. Like, I think that that is definitely a big part of it. I mean, there's so many things about it that like bother me in terms of like I I just genuine like I genuinely think that like rape should be treated very carefully on television and like not that the show can never do a rape scene by any means but that like it has to be super considered and it has to be more centralized because it like because we're so used to it especially shows like game of thrones like people are getting raped in the background in some scenes you know and it's like i to me this was just kind of part and parcel of their like oh well men like ramsey rape so santa's obviously going to get raped and she you know can't possibly have you know gained any wisdom about like how to deal with men or or attempted any you know strength in that in that arena uh, like but exactly also the fact that the little finger what yeah it sounds like you're how giving exactly her you too high a bar psychopath? like what is she meant to do to stop no him? no not not that like she could stop it but i i like envision that scene of her being like like you know because little finger has asked her like oh do you want to do this and she's like she like agrees to do it so she can get winterfell and then she has you know that that scene with the the girl who dies at the end of the season about how she's not afraid so in my head like you know sansa could like sit down on the bed and be like my lord tell me about yourself you know we've we're just married like she could have experience like like they're not not in that like Sansa should have stopped her rape but ways that the show could have presented Sansa being in a stronger mental position I, I think the way they show that is in her reaction you imagine a Sansa pre Elaine pre the transformation in season four going through the same thing making an arranged marriage to sort of you know a she wouldn't have done it with that same kind of agency she would have done it just to please someone rather than because she wanted something aka the north but b I think the recovery from it I think you know pre Elaine Sansa it would have broken her utterly Whereas post Elaine Sansa, who did do it for politics, who takes some sort of um, agency in that decision, I think has this not recovery because, of course, it's a brutal, brutalizing experience, but she becomes so so strong on the back of it and I think that aren't they showing the character I mean I don't you said it wasn't a centralizing thing I think like she's one of the central characters by the end of season seven you know she's standing there very powerfully of all the remaining major characters with one of the major character arcs and this rape has been one of the key things and I don't know I mean it's it felt to me like it was a very powerful reaction to it. But like that's also after they had several seasons to hear people being like, we're really upset about this. <laughs> In season five, I really don't think that you see much of Sansa's, you know, quote unquote growth. Oh no, or, because or... she's just being rescued at the end of it, right? So it's but, on but season why is she six being and seven. Rescued? Like, you know, like there's zero agency. There's nothing that is going on. And like, I, I just like Sansa is hated by so many people to begin with that like, to me, it was like, you have to give her a little more you know like but they do in six and seven i think you cut you're asking too much of them people hate, hate people hate her for it by the way <laughs> but, 
No, I don't know. This is this is always thought. I maybe it's just because this is what I thought would always happen to Sansa. That this is her arc. That she starts off as this snotty little romance, capital R kid, and we see her like fall into deep depression um, during and after her marriage to Tyrion. I mean, I think she's clinically depressed in that book when you do a close reading. And then she starts to take agency, albeit in a ham-fisted way with Meryn Tran. And then she becomes she goes through puberty, which is hugely significant. Um, She becomes the Elaine character, and then I think there is going to be a brutal rape and that this is going to be he she's going to become this badass and i think that sansa too this is exactly what i think is happening to her so maybe that's why i don't find it shocking or it doesn't piss me off because i think it's an awesome character arc i think it's just you see so much sexual violence in these books that just breaks women or where we don't get to see the reaction to it or it's just a horrible depressing sort of broken reaction and here's someone who seemingly is in such a power position by the end of it um i don't know yeah it just didn't bother me really didn't bother me and i apologize to any listener who's getting really offended now because i know some people will be and i'm just it's a blind spot maybe oh no no no! i'm not maybe offended i think it's really did. interesting some listeners will be there i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> to me like this is like i'll never feel the same about game of thrones uh, after this like they're wow. always in my bad book. but i i think it's really interesting and and like i you know obviously like i think you guys are both very smart incisive viewers and readers of the book so it's really interesting for me to like hear how you perceive it we're also both like I, I ardent know. sansa fans so maybe that's coloring us a lot yeah and weirdly yeah. i mean but to me like honestly yeah. seeing that happen to sansa was like so devastating really? <laughs> like i remember i remember sitting there on the couch like watching and being like frozen in horror and just being, i like, was actually like, relieved i was like this could have yeah. been handled in so much more of a crass manner this is actually relatively you know sort of like respectful from a from a got perspective <laughs> well i mean also I, i'm not sure how old so he was at the time <laughs> so yeah not sure how much um the, uh, the issue i do have with sansa's storyline is that she did not have enough time with little finger to acquire you know to become the politician that she's supposed to be that's also true like she's had yeah, so she needed more time just to be, you know, uh, to be her uh, little finger student. But that's true of all the, you know, if you think there are three, well, two major and one minor education arcs in Feast Dance. So the two major ones are John and Danny learning to rule failing, which adds piquancy to their later decisions, one hopes. And then there's also the, the Sansa learning from little finger. None of them have time because this is also compressed. And I remember thinking when John is assassinated, then is brought back by Melisandre, that a lot of the emotional weight from that was taken out of it for me because we need to see him try and try so hard to do the right thing but get caught between a rock and a hard place and fail to add emotional heft to him being knived by his people and we just didn't get that right and the same with Danny so I think you're right uh, Nadia right so the other yeah. big thing in season five which I, I realized in retrospect was a huge thing and I absolutely know now that's what Varley and Julia and Brett were telling me to stay off Twitter about was hashtag not my Stannis Nadia I mean... how did you feel about this this little juicy oh, nugget I- I, I I always loved Shireen like from the very beginning you know where she's she's eating in the show like not in the book in the show when she's eating there was her to read she's like a very innocent part of Game of Thrones and you don't have many of those characters and she's not just innocent she's she's pure you know she exactly and to have that happen to her it was it was so painful like that was probably the worst thing I, like her own parents gave the permission for Melisandre to burn her That's yeah it was so ridiculous I have to say I didn't get angry about it just because Stannis I feel had been you could just see stupidity coming in the way they were treating Stannis's character and I'm not I mean I like him as a character I'm not as much you know you've got real Stannis fans out there so it kind of annoyed me uh, but I was able to sort of mentally compartmentalize it so again I think that was a benefit of watching it away from the fandom but I can imagine if I'd have been watching it with all of you Mikhail getting really like pissed off about <laughs> that it was just ridiculous well, I got more upset then... I, 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 I'd written off Stannis show Stannis um, because they clearly didn't understand the character and they just kind of had him flailing about doing random things you know I mean even Stephen Delane has said like he's like I had absolutely no idea what I was doing like nothing seemed to connect yeah. nothing what, sense. he's like little finger kind of isn't he annoying. yeah what's your motivation yes. here I don't know character X needs to get to point Y so I'm gonna do something now <laughs> exactly so like to me that was like that kind of added more of the sting like when Stannis burns Shireen in the books which is going to happen I, again I anticipate I, probably I'll, I'll still be incensed but um wait you think I, it's gonna 
that happen in the books? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. They oh, came yeah, out yeah. like, the when George told us they're... about this, we were shocked. And it was like, they were so clearly covering their head on this. Yeah, but right. George but could change his mind. That... George could. Even... George told him shit 10 years ago. He can change his mind. I mean, that's, that's true. That's true. But, but I think even that... if he hadn't said that, um, there's this prophecy about Shireen that I think Melisandre has the prophecy about Shireen, where she sees these. I don't know. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of King's <laughs> blood. There's a lot of like, oh, maybe Shireen's actually still like sort of dead anyway because of the grayscale and the grayscale is going to come oh, back. Yeah, I like, think it's because um, uh, Melisandre thinks about her like that. Like she thinks of the smell of death coming from her or something. I don't I don't remember. I have to look I just thought up, that was plaguey like, stuff. It's prophesized. It's prophesized like uh, Shireen is Yeah, and there's skulls when she that. looks at hatch and, dates, right? And like... I just thought and that I was plague. Not- I mean, I think it's it's douchey if they kind of cover their tracks by saying, well, George told us. That, that's kind of stupid because that's a spoiler. So bad on you, d oh, yeah. that, um, that sucks. But then, but then even in the book, we have like multiple characters um, trying to get people of King's blood away from Stannis. Like, right, first was Dewa Siwa who got Edric Storm. And Edric Storm was Stannis' own nephew, um, even if he was bastard. He was he was Stannis' nephew. Um, and Stannis... Uh, was like they was was convinced that Stannis would burn her, which is why he took the massive step of getting out of the storm away. Um, and then John, when he had to hide, when he had to send Manchester's son away, um, because he thought that Stannis would cave into Melisandre's demands and let her burn him. Yeah, you're um, right. So this this is plausible. And, like he sent, yeah, and he sent like both Manchester's son and Maester Damon away. Like he was like, you know, if they figure out he's a Targaryen, he's gonna die too. So you know, it's th- it's been happening in the book all along. So then long. why are people getting Eventually, pissed off about? it then like if it's gonna happen anyways yeah I, well yeah I it's not... we're less upset about sure the shireen thing was at least I, I i can only speak for myself it's more the how again like the you know the fact that like this this kind of read to me as like they just need to clear the decks of this plot line they need to get rid of everybody so of course the second shireen dies her her mom commits suicide because that's another character they never understood then of course melisandre escapes with basically no consequences and like gets the hell out of dodge george is kind of the master of consequences right like i anticipate there being much more experience with this than just that but but i will say that like i found that scene just i profoundly upsetting like maybe that's good that's maybe good more upsetting to watch but that's you know? good tv it, that's, sh- sure that's good sure of course but but i yeah. just i still did but there was a lot like, of this that was just such a race through and i remember getting to the season five and being oh shit they did feast dance in one season whoa i mean like the two baggiest books and they just they just motored through like i hadn't realized that's what they were doing i know everyone of all of you knew that but to me that was yeah. itself a shock and i was like oh shit okay um and you, you see that they right did away with so many of the, they did away with so many of the storylines like they did is Quinton that's like five chapters right there then they don't have fake Egan that's you know a lot of the storyline goes with that you know so get rid of Mans like, get rid of Barris and Selmy yeah exactly you know they've just cut away a lot of stuff that was going in different directions so they've kind of condensed it to this one central you know which I don't mind I mean maybe they did the pruning too harshly but I'd rather have the pruning too harshly than the bagginess of dance so I'm kind of like that, that's fair enough I think and then to balance against all of that, so I guess, so Mikhail, in retrospect, which was, did the Sansa thing cause more trauma than the Stannis thing in Volk? <laughs> um, I don't know. I was I was very, like, uh, blinded by my own feelings, and obviously still am to a certain degree. I know that, I honestly, I think that a lot of people sort of expect it. Oh, you know, you know what it was, though? I think people weren't sure if Stannis was dead, because they have that scene really weird, where, like, you know, they, they don't show Brienne killing him. It's like, okay, well, that's the one point where they show a little discretion for the viewers. Yeah, that, was, really weird. Sure why. that was weird. That was weird. So people weren't sure he was dead, so it was partly, like, it was part rage on a lot of people's part, um, and part acceptance, because, you know, when you look back, it was kind of clear that they didn't know where this character was going, yeah. and, like, and but then also that, that like but is this story over or are we gonna have like you know badass Dennis re-rallying <laughs> troops you know like joining with Brienne who finds forgiveness in her heart or something like that um, oh god for me that wasn't the weird part of that scene it's just that Brienne suddenly comes across Stannis who's like the one person left standing on the entire field and Ramsay Bolton who's out for Stannis's head is nowhere to be seen I know like, yeah. I know it's, yeah it's so convenient yeah. for Brienne to find him and kill him it's it's, it's a very forced scene. As amazing as the Battle of the Bastards is, like the Battle of Ice, what's supposed to be the Battle of Ice, is like, is so hilarious. Oh, <laughs> the thing about Game of Thrones, right, is like, it does reach some incredible highs. It really does. But then, then when it goes, when it hits those 
those lows, it's it's quite appalling. <laughs> like yeah. not not to not to segue into Dorne too early, maybe, but like all of Dorne is like, what the fuck? Is oh, going this on? is very boring. Like he oh, got yeah. this um Bron and Jamie Dornish road trip, which was kind of funny. I was like, okay. Um, I just didn't give a shit about any of that. Marcella dies. Whoopee, great. Uh, even the Arya stuff, I don't care. She kills Meryn Trank, goes blind, whatever. Um, yeah, death of Aemon, okay. Not as sad as it was in the book, so whatever. Drogon. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what bothered me about Shireen. Uh, no, not Shireen. We did that already. About Marcella. Um, it was just that, like, they had started this plot line where it's like, oh, she's going to be, you know, a person. And, and then, like, she was this kind of, like, very silly little girl who then, you know, is killed by the, the, the misplaced anger of the, the Sand Snakes, which to me... Yeah. You know, like, it's... Also it's a, uninteresting. I, I get, Don't care. Yeah. and I But I get why, like, they made Alaria more bloodthirsty, but at the same time, it's like, that's a really powerful character in the books that she is totally uninterested in this. And, like, if, if they could have incorporated some of that, like, even have the Sand... I mean, the Sand Snakes were crazy stupid anyway. I heard somebody say that they like they basically put all seven sand snakes in a blender and then poured out what came out into three different cups and gave them different names and a weapon so like that's, that's okay though yeah, but that's too many like, sand snakes anyway. Oh no, no, no! Not in terms of they're not being seven. Yeah. That's fine. Um, but just in terms of them having like distinct personality. <laughs> oh, okay. There yeah. are eight yeah. sand snakes. Just you know, just to point that out. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Um. So <laughs> Dawn, Jamie. I mean, I think actually the big the big thing I realized in season five is that as much as I want things to be compressed, because Brienne doesn't change as a character for her wandering, but Tyrion and Jamie do change in feast dance, and Tyrion becomes really dark, and Jamie becomes distanced from Cersei I mean that's kind of like the whole reason why we need to have the step scene and everything that comes afterwards and it's just like you suddenly realize or it dawns on me okay so Tyrion they're gonna just keep as a nice wise guy because that's what the fans love huh okay well that's a bit boring and then Jamie is just gonna basically keep on being Cersei's lapdog at least until the very end of season seven and I was like okay so one of the most interesting character arcs in this book that I'm really invested in is not gonna happen and that was sad to me so I think that didn't really truly dawn on me until season six but even at the end of season five I was like okay so we're not going to have the space now for Jamie to become independent, are we? So that was sad to me. Yeah, yeah. They they slam on the break on his character development. Like they kind of go partly where the book is, and then they just, they either slam on the break, break or or pull the pull reverse. You know, they really kind of go backwards where he throws in his lot with Cersei, and that was like, you know, that was yeah. that wasn't fun to watch because it it is such a compelling part of the story and one that you know even of itself causes so much debate you know um so to to see that kind of negated was very disappointing i i didn't expect them to go dark with Tyrion though they they liked Tyrion way too much to have him you know skirt much of a moral morally ambiguous line i think yeah. so yeah i mean it's a commercial enterprise he's their most popular character right so to a yeah. certain extent i'm surprised they went as dark as they did with arya especially when she's in winterfell sort of messing with I was like, oh, they really are going for it here. So guess guess who the internet was rooting for in that situation? Yeah, I know. That's because you guys are a bunch of psychos. Um <laughs> Psycho <laughs> apologist. I was like, guys, Sansa's asking her sister why she has a bag full of face skin. How is that not normal? Like, how is that wrong? Yeah. I want Arya <laughs> dead. Arya to me is in the same category as dragons. She got to go. She got mm. to go. Okay. Like, on to season yeah. six. Actually, I mean, I. Hold I, on. Did you talk about the Walk of Shame? Oh, that was that awesome. Was... That just comes under the category oh, of, like, amazingly yeah. filmed, amazingly acted. Just went to Dubrovnik just over a year ago, recognized all the the streets loved it oh everything to the faith militant and cersei in season five was to me a total highlight i loved all that stuff oh yeah 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 no that that was good the the walk of shame was good and i think that they they played a good line of like where you are in the book of like both being kind of satisfied and also being horrified and like both rooting for and against cersei at the same time so that that i thought was well done yeah it's a delicate and line i think they captured how well you know how long it takes to get from one part of you to another mm. like it's seen itself is so long you get how like at the beginning cersei walks out she's got like her head held high and you know but then it just keeps on going and going and going and you start to see your shoulder fall and it's it's just terrible. Like, yeah, Lena I, Headey, I hate Cersei. Very, but very. But then, good. fear for her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Love it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think her face is like 
moved much <laughs> since season one. <laughs> like maybe an eyebrow or two. But like, yeah, she's she's very, very powerful in what she does. Yeah, it's a great part. Okie dokie, on to season six. So a summary of what happens, broadly speaking. Sansa and Zombie John defeat Ramsay Bolton in battle, but not before Rick and dies. No. R plus L equals J is confirmed. Tree Bran is still ambulant. Shocking. Cersei tortures the Great Sept. Loras and Marjorie die. Tom and Tops of himself. Sand snakes kill Doran, ally with Queen of Thorns. Arya kills the Wave and returns to Westeros. The Hound lives. Jamie takes River Run and kills the Blackfish. Arya kills Walter Frey. Sam goes to Old Town via his family, Nick's a sword. Danny takes command of the Dothraki, then flies back to the Battle of Marine. Daria is left in command. Danny goes to Westeros with new allies, Theon and Yara, after the Euron coup. Um, other stuff happened too. But it doesn't feel like there was as big of a single issue or issues like uh, Not My Stannis. So what was the biggest touch point in this season? Like what were the things that people got really angry about, Mikhail? Ah, uh, I think probably the the anything like the beginning w- with Dorne people were definitely like all right what <laughs> you know? yeah like okay um i wonder why yeah right it's baffling um i think i think that people were maybe upset about like at least i was upset about the Rickon thing i thought that was really a bummer um oh, that was so brutal about, but so well yeah. done he's here I mean, that, that he's thing, running though, like with, he's not here with, he's dead <laughs> fuck oh it's actually that's really funny the, the actor art parkinson like wrote on twitter um and you know like it's also crazy because because like you know I've, i i remember when the show was greenlit i remember the day these kids were cast and like writing to them on twitter and being like you know when they were like eight and nine years old being like oh my gosh you're gonna be so great this is gonna be amazing so like art parkinson's been on twitter also since like 2000 11 and like to see him grow up into an adult and finally like the final thing of his game of thrones experience was writing should have zigzagged <laughs> 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 um and like oh. twitter was yelling like zigzag right <laughs> yeah, um, yeah but, but that, that, that plot line was a little disappointing in terms of like how they got rid of um of osha you know and and um some of that like definitely not my personal favorite like again just kind of people could have been in powerful positions or at least made the most of their of their end but it's all kind of in service to the bad guy um so not not my favorite also the umbers the umbers are like super evil in the show I know, I know. like i don't know yeah they don't they... or family whatever but like it's tough i still can't believe john killed yeah. ollie I was a bit I know. Harsh. I know. I was okay. brutal. Ollie, and, Ollie, and Rickon are the two most like hard done by kids in this season. I thought yeah. that was pretty sad. And people, people are like, "Oh, that stupid kid, he betrayed him." I'm like, "Did you guys not remember that the kids saw his entire family slaughtered by these same wildlings? Like, not other wildlings, Tor- Tormund and Egret. Like, that is who killed them. And then he's like seeing John do this. Like, it makes perfect sense. And then they're like, "Oh, I hate that kid. Kill him." And it was like, really funny because just after watching this, I was literally five days later standing in the bit of Iceland where they had filmed the attack on the wildling village and our tour guide was like showing us like screenshots of of when that attack happened and Ollie's family being killed and was saying and then this is how it ends for Ollie and I was like god you know John you lack of empathy bastard I mean literally bastard I mean <laughs> come on what are you doing mate yeah. well not bastard as R plus L equals J tells us so um yeah that was brutal in general I didn't have many issues with this I wonder however if we need to have a conversation somewhere in VOC not today about the treatment of suicide at VOC we talk a lot about how rape is treated and sexual violence and mm. is it given to you care it feels like a lot it, it seems to have become like an easy plot thing oh we've got a character now who's kind of at a loose end like Celise like Tommen let's just get them to commit suicide because that's just a quick and easy way of getting rid of them now Mm -hmm. so I'll tell you Celise I 100% agree that was 100% just like erasing her from the name board that they have um I I actually disagree in terms of Tommen because I thought that they had played that pretty well in terms of him really being like he really wanted this marriage to work. He you know we, obviously unlike in the books they're actually sleeping together. He was very much in love with her and like was following the faith and kind of doing everything that that like to get her freed. And then yeah. for Cersei to be the one who's responsible for ha- for her being murdered and like all and, and for his spiritual mentor to be murdered at the same time, you know, and like, you know, half of the people he knows and has grown up with, like to me, it actually A, made a lot of sense and B, was a really interesting twist on the whole like, you know, 
know, despairing princess throwing herself from the tower. Like I thought. Oh, okay. Young, That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really kind of, I hate to say this about a suicide, especially of a child, but it was, it played almost romantically for me. And that like, I sort of kind of hope that like the small folk are telling each other like romantic stories about, you know, King Tommen who loved his lady so much that he, you know, threw himself off the tower when she died and, you know, joined yeah. her in the whole trope or is so problematic, isn't it? Anyway, but that's for yeah. another no, day. Oh, no, it's problematic, but like I kind of, I prefer that to, you know, mm. yeah. But I love the whole burning of the scepter bit. I just thought it was all brilliant, I have to say. Yeah, and the, the tension was so crazy. Like, I haven't watched any of this again, you know, for multiple reasons, but the but that particular scene, even though I loved it a lot, I can't bear to rewatch it. It's way too tense. And like, you know, especially because I really like Marjorie and like just seeing her being yeah. like, she oh. knows what's going to happen. She knows. Exactly when she figures it out, that is like, um, that's an amazing scene. It's so well acted. Like when she figures out what's about to happen, like she knows that something's wrong. Yep. And for all of you who she... are, are missing your Natalie Dormer fix, I can strongly recommend watching the new remake of Picnic at Hang- Picnic at Hanging mm-hmm. Rock, which is an all-time Australian Gothic classic. Um, it stars her. She's all over it, and it's an acting masterclass. So go watch that. Sorry, Nadia, continue. She's so good. She's so good. Yeah. I think we do have to oh, thank yeah, no, the show for for bringing her to the prominence that she was because she wasn't a damn she good already because of Tudors. Oh, she was. I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm biased, but I, I do feel like people really were like, oh my god, you know, like yeah. the Tudors was kind of like soapy, terrible. <laughs> but honestly, Picnic at Hanging Rock yeah. is so good on so many levels. It's Amazon, right? Yeah, and not because I want to vok about it with you guys, but you'll need to watch it. Okay. But Natalie sure. Dormer for the win. I loved everything to do with King's Landing in this season. I did not love everything to do with Jamie and River Run and Edmure and the Blackfish. That was just all stupid. Why would Blackfish do that? Like, why oh, that would he so escape? Dumb. Exactly. Why would he die for nothing? That, I mean, I could really basically hear him saying, like, well, the writers tell me that they can't write any more storylines for me and can't afford to have me on the show anymore, so I'm just going to commit suicide. Yeah. You know, it was so I, I don't think it's tough. okay to use suicide in that way and mentally. I agree. Yeah, yeah. It's not okay. Um, I think maybe maybe part of the difference, Bina, is just, like, Tom and, like, it's not a good thing, you know? Like, it's a very sad thing that he has committed suicide. I, whereas for, like, the Blackfish, I feel like it's like, well, he went out like a warrior, and it's like, but that was completely that's unnecessary. Just yeah, it's, it's exactly. Silly. And that's, I think, this is this whole river run thing is when I realized how I wasn't going to get, like, there's no point, like, caring about Jamie. It's kind of like, just disassociate from yourself from it. It's going to be like Stannis. They don't know how to handle this character. Just, it's fanfic. It's bad fanfic at that, so just ignore it. Um, so, anything else in the season that was good or bad or. R plus L equals J confirmed. Did people lose their shit? Did people lose their shit? Did uh, all the R plus R plus P equals D kind of people or whatever it is? <laughs> like start R like, like a D, I, I think that was R plus L equals F plus G yeah. equals H. I mean like, you know, yeah. It was it was shit hitting the fan. <sighs> um, I think people I, I think it was kind of the, the combinations you'd expect. I think a lot of people were like almost taken aback that they confirmed it, you know, because it was you know, to see that so um, blatantly, you know, it's a little, it, it does kind of shock you a little bit. Uh, so, I mean, that that was my reaction anyway. Not that I was surprised. I was almost relieved to like, see it. It was like, okay, yeah. finally. Okay. <laughs> we all yeah. know it. It's like, it's like, you know, if you know someone's cheating on someone, someone else, and then finally it comes out and it's like, finally, like we all knew right. what was happening anyway. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, I mean, I, I don't think anyone was like beating their breasts, but I think that, um, yeah, it was, it was maybe kind of like a, What's that? You guys said about not spoiling anything, <laughs> you know? Because they kept saying like, "Oh no, we're not really going to spoil anything." And then it's like, "All right." Cool. I don't get how you get to the ending without confirming it one way or the other. Like John's parentage is the whole point of this series of books, so at some point Bran's going to have to spill. I think I yeah. was more shocked to see Bran make I mean I love the whole Hodor I mean that's just amazing right but I was just shocked to see Tree Bran not stay Tree Net I was amazed to see him back at Winterfell yes. that to me was more jarring I was like but then I was yeah, like thinking I to myself coming back. well how does he get the knowledge out then if not through that does he do it through dreams three eyed crow dreams but it was almost like why are you back that's just annoying to me go away again there's too many Stark kids now fuck off because <laughs> you're not really a Stark anyway so you're just standing there being all sort of Lego last like and making these grand pronouncements from a distance and it's just weird so yeah but I, I really like the way they did the flashbacks though I thought yeah. that was like I, I did like those too yeah and the tower of joy it was it was just it was cool to see it just was yeah 
there was there were some things that like I just have to be like I enjoy watching this. You know, yeah, I I want to see the Tower of Joy. This is cool. Like this is yeah. this is what TV can do. It can visualize something of me that I've been imagining for like twenty years. So you know, good on you. It's weird that Bran seems more Stark-like when he's in the vision. Like when he's watching the whole Tower of Joy thing unfolding, he's he wants to go. He wants to follow it father he wants to see what he's doing and he's out of the visions he's like this like robot like person um who doesn't feel anything so it's really weird to go from one to the other yeah I don't know. It's kind of awkward. Yeah, I, I do have a lot of beef with the way Bran develops. Like, I actually, I was shocked to see him leaving the tree because in my head, like, there's, I thought, I thought that, like, the whole point of his arc was that he doesn't leave the tree because, like, yeah. that's, like, the final decision he's making. Fine. Like, I, I don't care. Whatever. That doesn't bother me. Um, Whether it's the same or different, that's fine. Um, but, Like, it's like, did you guys, like, do you not like Isaac Hempstead right anymore? Like, do you not want to write him as a character? <laughs> you know, because, like, he just turns into, like, this zombie, you know, just kind of, like, it makes oh, no sense. I it's just say, say the past. Yeah. And like, you know, again, a character that we've re- seen from a kid, like we already have Arya who's, you know, half uncommunicative. Sansa, who's obviously not sharing anything that she's thinking. Um, so like to have that be so permanent, you know, and and to have Summer die on top of all of that. That was And no one seems to give a shit about Rick and once he's dead. Like no one mentions no. him again. Which is a bit harsh. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so season six, I thought overall was actually okay. It didn't bother me at all. Yeah. No, I mean, like I said, they they had a lot of work to even get me to like tolerate the show. And season six did. Yeah. So. And you know, I don't know why the sand stakes still exist at this point, but. Yeah, Yeah, I was wondering why the House of Black and White let Arya go. Like she kills the base. Oh, don't get me started. I don't understand that. Like what was the the point of her going through all the training if she was just going to leave without becoming an assassin for the many-faced god? If if the many-faced god does not send an assassin to kill Arya before the end of season, and eight as payback. See, this is what I keep saying. It's the like, biggest fan service bullshit. Off. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Also, uh, not to mention the fact that she gets stabbed in the belly and then falls into a dirty canal and is like, all right. And then still this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no infection. Take it off, you know. Yeah. So she better die before the end for so many reasons and so many levels. Um, I agree. The best the best single sentence in season six, Bron, your brother has decided to side with the cockless. I love Bron <laughs> so much. The cockless. I just love it. Okay. Um oh, so... is that is that the scene wait, when when do Grey Wind and Grey Grey Worm and Missandei have sex? Because I really love those two. I ship them so hard. Yeah, was that in season six or seven? Maybe that was in yeah, seven. Um Yeah, maybe it was early seven. But that was that was lovely. The highlight of season six, highlight of season six for me was Battle of the Bastards. Mm, yeah, hands down. Like but, the, that and the Hodor the, scene. Yeah, they just the, the the way they captured the chaos of war in that in that whole scene, it was amazing. Really well done. I agree. I agree. Yeah, and oh, and obviously the Hodor thing. That is He's like the that. secret hero the of impact. Song of Ice and Fire, isn't he? Yeah, it's just such a cool. Yeah, name. and then Sad. and then you really you know, and then when you get the line from Mira where she was like, "Why did we go there at all? What was the point?" You know, Jojen died for that. Hodor died for that. And like, what has anyone gotten out of that yet? We still don't understand. Well, John. Knows Knowing his parentage, they better fucking save the world. What well, happened? who John's parents are why do we need Bran to go to a because we're not going to see Howl and Reed or I don't know Um, is Howl and Reed definitely not the High Septon then or the High Sparrow or whatever (laughs) probably not okay Color me disappointed. Um, okay, on to season seven. So a bunch of stuff happens, and it was it was interesting. I was trying to make this into a summary bullet points, and it was all very disparate, which seemed to me a very key telling point about season seven. Okay, Arya por- poisons the rest of the phrase, heads to Winterfell. Looks like she's fighting with Saria, but R.I.P. Littlefinger Bh. Helped by Tree Brand's mm-hmm. evidence. Sam cures the Jorah. He goes back to Danny. Bronn is with the Brotherhood without banners and believes in the Lord of Light. Apparently, Euron wants wants to earn Cersei's trust, so it goes into battle for her against Yara slash Theon. She then makes him co-head of her army and promises to marry him. Awesome. Euron destroys the unsullied ships who f- uh, found an abandoned castle rock, while Jaime attacks Highgarden and the Queen of Thorns uh, again kind of commits suicide. While for confessing she killed Joffrey, John becomes king of the north, heads to Dragonstone, doesn't bend the knee, but Sam's told him there's lots of dragon glass there. Danny leads an aerial attack on the Lannisters. Um, Tormund the Hound, John Gendry, et 
Alcatra White as proof for Cersei, which is so stupid. A White Walker kills Viserion. Benjamin Stark turns up and then dies. Fan service. And then we get Zombie Viserion. All crazy balls. Uh, Cersei's pregnant. She wants to use the Golden Company to, uh, you know, secure her rule over King's Landing. Jamie rides north because he's finally pissed off with her after like three seasons later than he should be. Theon needs a rescue for Yara. Um, Sam and Bran together realise that John is a legitimate Targ heir called Aegon. And Zombie Viserion blasts a hole in the wall and, you know, bad things come through. So that's like some of many things that are going on. The torment is still fine. Yeah, there's a lot of shit going on here. Um... I mean, I love everything. I thought Winterfell was really fascinating. Let's start there. I thought it was really interesting seeing um, lots of people getting freaked out by Arya. I'm a little bit disappointed the f- the fandom isn't more freaked out by Arya. The whole Arya kind of stalking oh, and being yeah. weird about Sansa is just very creepy and psycho. And even by the end of it, I mean, it's nice to see her kill Littlefinger. To me, it's a bit like the Walk of Shame. I'm pleased it happened. I'm getting my vicarious revenge. But at the same time, it's, it's not right. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, um, yeah, that that to yeah. me was very much like you know that final scene is great. I actually just recently rewatched it. Like I'm I'm very pleased with the way it plays out, but I don't think it was worth all of the tension and all of the you know especially because it it, it goes a little weird, right? Like when Arya initially gets back to Winterfell, it actually seems like she and Sansa are gonna be okay. Like clearly they don't understand each other, but they're yeah. they're kind of happy that they are alive and exist. Um, and I was like, hey, good on the show for not, like, manufacturing dumb drama. And then, like, next, the next, like, three episodes are all this dumb drama of Sansa being like, holy shit, my sister wants to kill me. And Arya making every indication that she wants to kill her. And, you know, and then the fandom being like, Sansa, why are you so against Arya? And Littlefinger just messing everything up. And, you know, so I was happy with the way it ended. But I wrote a very long article about how, like, dumb the plot line was. And, like, how it was basically sent each of the Stark sisters back to... To their original position which is like oh we can't get along except that now there's like potentially deadly consequences well, so exactly. I wasn't into that. It was like so Jamie doesn't get growth, Tyrion doesn't get growth Arya's, Arya and Sansa get growth but then get sent back to when they were 11 or something mm-hmm. and it was like it's just one of those classic tropes, it's sort of like real housewives like let's get two women who've become really strong and then let's just pit them against each other like mean bitches you know mm-hmm. can they not Can they not actually work together uh, oh, it was just all so kind of like high school in some way I really hated it yeah, yeah. And I also had a real problem analogous to kind of what's going on a bit with Danny, actually. But it's sort of what does it say about us as a fandom that D&D think commercially it's going to sell to let Arya be this creepy and psycho that this is like Tyrion's really popular. We can't let him get dark, but Arya is going to be really popular if we let her go this dark. Let's see a little, you know, because, you know, the Maisie isn't she's not a kid anymore, but she still looks very childlike. Let's have this little psycho killer running around. And I find that whole thing really problematic problematic about what it says about us as a fandom am i the only one or i don't know maybe i'm going too far on this no i completely I agree. agree yeah yeah I've... it's also sorry go ahead nadia no i just i was just gonna say i've had issues with the aria storyline for a long time so i'm not surprised that i have issues to show either yeah that's true that's true mm-hmm. yeah it's also like again it kind of goes back to that like it's they, they kind of don't know how to make women cool if they're not either total badasses or bitches you know yeah. like like I love Brienne because of the residual love that I have for her from the book but like this Brienne is not Brienne from the book like yeah. the Brienne from the book is compassionate and like insight like not very smart but still very emotionally insightful and like and this Brienne is just just a badass you know why is like, she even it. still around she's killed Stannis so she's got revenge for her love Renly the sisters are back together and just fuck I mean like why are you there. what is motivating it's like davos what is motivating you at this point stannis is dead do you just transfer allegiance somehow now to danny i just don't get it yeah, the next person. yeah. also ed sharon yeah. why are you there <laughs> that annoyed me more than any other storyline in the entirety of these three seasons that was funny who is more annoying than any of these characters put together ed sharon why are you in my drama go it's away it's not that he was annoying the scene was fine it's just oh he was ed annoying she- so, he no, takes you out of it Ed completely. Sheeran, and he takes exactly when you see him, you go like, "That's Ed Sheeran." It is, there's no other. <laughs> you don't think of anything else. And I don't know. It's like if you have a cool Icelandic band playing in the Red Wedding, like discreet, like no one cares. 
Ed Sheeran? Go away. Go away, you ginger fool. It's a shame Ari didn't Mets kill him. Pitcher who was in uh, the fourth episode. Who was? A New York Mets pitcher who was in the fourth episode. Springs, yeah. He was a Lannister oh. soldier. Yeah, see, I don't know who that is, so I don't care, but I know who Ed Sheeran is. <laughs> I, I know who he is, and I didn't recognize him, so... <laughs> But that's the way to do it, right? To blend in, yeah. not be conspicuous. Exactly. I mean, the story is Maisie Williams is a huge Ed Sheeran fan, so they did it as like a present to her, and I'm like, cool, but no. like, I didn't really care. But but it was yeah. Just it, honestly, what bothered me a little too much about that scene, though, and maybe this is dumb, is just like we haven't had this this like gray perspective that George has about you know the Lannisters, and like we we really haven't done that so far. And then all of a sudden, Arya stumbles across the only group of Lannister soldiers apparently in the entire army who are like caring for their dads and expecting babies and are like I know. great dudes who just happen to be on the wrong side yeah. and, and like it's not bad of itself it's just within the context of everything in the show it was like so cl- so so writerly you so ham fisted and I love I love the idea of that sympathy for the common soldier because basically they're all just humans right but it's like and then you undermine it with having a cheer in there right <sighs> and also having Arya not really take the lesson from that ultimately yeah, so John, King in the North, so predictable. Song of Ice and Fire, so he's going to meet Danny. You know they're going to get jiggy with it. It's just like, okay. It is, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know why Davos is there. I don't know why they have to go and capture a white to persuade Cersei. That just seems so Oh, that is so dumb. That was like, that that was like they put the show in hell. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are whites, like, turning up everywhere. Why did they have to go to, like, this one place that is, like, the most dangerous of all and get the whites from there? They could have just found a dead body, wait for it to reanimate, and then come back. Or, like, take somebody who's bad behind the wall, kill them, and then wait five minutes. Like, exactly. I know. <laughs> and then just when it can't get more ridiculous, Uncle Benjamin turns up, and then he'd, I mean, oh. That, to me, was in the level of Ed Sheeran. It's like, Ed Sheeran was indulgent for Maisie Williams, and Uncle Benjamin was indulgent for us and it was just no we don't need to see this the, the Benjamin thing for me was more confusing just in my head because in my head Benjamin is cold hands even though I know that George has said that Benjamin is not cold hands so it like kind of doubled down for me on how much the fandom including the showrunners are like yeah but he's cold hands though yeah I know cold exactly yeah. like in my head canon he's totally cold hands exactly um, like, but speak to me speak to me of ice dragon law masters law mistresses is ice dragons a thing can that oh, happen oh I love that it looks awesome I don't no, but I love the whole I love the whole dead dragon getting the animated thing. So I thought it was awesome and then some I thought there must be somewhere out there, some kind of Westeros.org lawmaster who's like, But this cannot happen. Um but can it happen? Are people cool with this? Because this is very cool. I, mean, I don't know. It's a dragon, right? They can animate any. They can reanimate any animal, right? A human, an animal, whatever. So why not a dragon? Is living thing dead? I I feel like yeah. I feel like it's possible. Also, I mean, see what what I I think is actually more likely is that one of the dragons, or at least one of the dragons, gets turned against Danny. Um, because I just think that dragon versus dragon is cooler than dragons all on one side. Exactly. Right? You know? it's a, it's, that, it's, you've got to have at some point dragon versus dragon, or it's not going to end, yeah. right? So, exactly. Yeah. So. So I I tend less I mean the, the funny thing is we've been arguing about ice dragons for a really long time because of the, like the story you know the the, the the children's book quote unquote that that George wrote um, you know which is called the ice dragon and is about that so like there's there's been that whole thing and like oh is there like a dragon in Winterfell that's like an ice dragon or something. Um, I really don't know. I'm genuinely like very neutral on whether or not that specific thing will come to pass in the books. Um, other than the the a dragon gets turned against Danny. That's that's what I know. Yeah. Okay. So we'll find out. But um, I was not as averse to this as I thought I might be on paper because it just looked good. And again, that's what the show does well. I mean, it really knocked that out of the park. That was amazing. But yeah, a lot a lot else of that North stuff and John stuff just and Sansa versus Arya stuff was. And, yeah, I just didn't need any of that. And no mention of Rickon and Bran just being a douchebag. All right, don't get me started on the people who were like, Sansa passed the sentence but didn't swing the sword. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, <laughs> are you fucking kidding me? It's this just misogyny. Is... The hard time that people yeah. give Sansa is just basic old school misogyny. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Also, they think it's her fault that Rickon died. I'm like, I don't even know how you guys function in the world. How, is it, how can it possibly be her fault? Like, how? Because she turned down the army or didn't get the armies and then took the armies and it was some weird thing and it was like y- you know what y- y'all just want to hate Sansa so like I can't yeah 
what is interesting to me more in that whole sort of year on kind of situation is um so cersei is pregnant do you think she's really pregnant do you think this is going to happen in the books that once she's got rid of all her kind of incestuous babies she is going to potentially have a genuine heir with with jamie i don't know what do you reckon well that's possible if you know we all know about maggie the frog's prophecy right where she says um when cersei asks about the children she's gonna have and um says six and ten for him and three for you and maybe that's just talking about the duration of their marriage um i don't know yeah. Yeah, I I tend to think that this won't happen in the in the book. I think that they need to give Cersei more motivation in the show. Um which is fine. Um I definitely think she is pregnant in the show. I I don't really see the point in them faking it. Uh, I don't see the point in Cersei faking it either. Um since she thinks she can boss Jamie around no matter what, you know. So um yeah. It makes I mean, Jamie was... leaving her worse in some way, right? Cuz he's also leaving his unborn child. Yeah, but also better because he's really choosing what's right for the world. You know what I mean? Ah, rather than his family. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, his character's so messed up by now. Does it even matter? It's it's true, yeah. But yeah, then, I like, don't know. the show also had like um, a Cersei had a, a, a child with Robert too, right? So they're not they're disregarding the prophecy entirely. So not right. Fine. I'm not even sure if that line was in it. They they changed Mary's. Uh, I mean, not Mary, the Maggie's thing. So it's possible that they. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what that though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I will admit though, I'm totally fine with John and Danny. I'm like, you're both pretty, whatever. <laughs> like, it was gonna happen, right? Like I I just feel it's a bit like R plus L equals J or Yeah. You know, a lot of the stuff that we saw that it's kinda weird seeing it, but we always knew we were gonna see it. So mm-hmm. it was kinda like I I didn't like it because I just thought it was such a cliched fantasy thing. But you know, George George can't subvert everything. Like this was the big one that was gonna happen. I just cause I think John is so stark, so seeing him become all target is just a shame. Yeah. But it is what it is. Yeah. You know, two little short people get together and have sex. <laughs> it's true it's also like i mean just for me it was like oh two people are having sex and they want to <laughs> like they both want to consent to your sex i know <laughs> i'm like this is a nice change but undermined a little bit and i tell you this is another big problem i've always had with these books and you know everyone knows my anti-dragon rants but in this season in particular um is it this season or the one before where danny raises the lannister is this one where danny raises the lannister army and i think Bron and Jamie are there with a trebuchet built by uh, Kyburn. Um, and you just see her lay waste to her enemies. And yeah. you see visualized mm-hmm. what I've always been saying, which is that, you know, dragons are this weapon of mass destruction and there's just no excuse for them. And this is what HBO does. It gives us this visual spectacle. Even though you read it in the books, even though you imagine it, you see it on screen. And then you look at these people like, you know, like the misunders of the world, or even people like Tyrion who are still on her side. And you think, come on, guys, once you have seen this how can you still be on her side it isn't it's just it's beyond you know yeah no it's so seeing it's john tough. like macking with danny like this beautiful romantic capital r ice and fire couple and you know this is meant to be our beautiful culmination at the end of these books full of sorrow and rape and pillage and death and destruction and that these two come together and will set the world to right and will reign as a beautiful couple over the universe and you just think no <laughs> or i think no oh well i, I don't yeah, i don't know gonna happen. you don't think danny's yeah. gonna reign good I, I'm not sure if she's going to reign. I'm still very, very agnostic about who's going to end up on the Iron Throne. But I do think that um, we're geared like this is the this is the happy peak before the, the sad fall. Like, I, I do not think that Danny is going to take kindly to the fact that John is not only legitimate, but more legitimate and more in line to the throne than she is. And, you know, uh-huh. and they're related <laughs> also. Um, like, I think. Yeah. The, yeah. There's a lot of ways in which this could go wrong. Do you there's, think there's, there's a civil war? Do you think John versus Danny happens potentially? I don't know that they have time for that with the others, but I think that well, they might. I don't know. In the book, we know there's a second dance of the dragon coming, so that's probably going to be between Danny and Aegon, or you know, Danny and John versus Aegon or something. So, but you never know. It might be Danny John, though. Who knows? Ooh. Any other predictions? What's where is Malisandra at this point? Is she off to Valantis or something? No, she has to die in Westeros, right? Isn't that what she said? No, I hope so. Yeah. I think that was her, her like vague thing. I was like, oh yes, I have to stay. Cause... Oh, but the stag, the stag was so touching. You know, when when they were finds it. Oh, oh god. god. Oh. Yeah. 
that was that was painful. Also, like I agree with you, um, Bina. There's there's very little reason for Davos to be around, but I just kind of like enjoy him. So I'm just kind of like, that's fine. <laughs> you know? Oh, I agree, right? Like, you know, I love that actor and I yeah. love that character, right? So he's in that category of people that you know there are people that were killed very very quickly, and then there are people who are around you like you have no reason to be around, but that's okay. Um, yeah. I think that I think that's the whole thing, right? With this whole season five three seven, I think of the three seasons, six was probably my favorite of the three seven was the kind of more janky but it's kind of like i'm in a very zen place of calm i can take the set pieces or the emotional bits that i really like and the bits that i don't like i can very quickly now mentally discard and i think i just needed that year and a half or two years off just to get to that mental place and i really admire people who could get to that dissociative place earlier it just took me a little longer to get there and i think i'm there so even the bits like now that i'm saying that are annoying me they, they honestly i just flushed them away very quickly um they didn't <laughs> four really... years you know you didn't watch all for four years yeah it went by very quickly i have to say and on that happy note, I want to thank Nadia and Mikhail for joining me tonight too. Uh, and I actually, I want to repeat my thanks to this entire beautiful community of Vok for helping Nadia and I stay basically unsullied, which is a huge achievement in the era of social media. And, and we owe it all to all of you who really did respect our decision and helped us to stay unsullied. So thank you. And sorry if we let you down by giving in. We're only human. Thank you, Mikhail, for discussing all this with us. <laughs> oh, gosh. Thank you for listening to my, my like, rant from 2015 it's it's uh it's very cathartic honestly hopefully it wasn't like dredging up trauma to relitigate all of this no no no. it's good to look at it like especially you know with you two ladies uh, whose opinions i i value so highly it's like so nice to kind of look back and go like have a little bit more I, I can kind of see both like my extremely emotional reaction and then your guys like a little bit more pain <laughs> side no, of just just so just watching it with nice. more detachment maybe but um you know it was just yeah. fun and it was great to podcast with both of you again for, after a long time it was so lovely so thanks hopefully speak to you all soon all right bye yeah, ladies thanks bye ladies thank you for this Vina. Yeah. We've been waiting that long for a book. Oh, no well, longer, right? We've been waiting for seven, oh, not, six, oh, seven, five, years? seven years because it came out in 2011. Years. But that's mm-hmm. the calm. And then you realize just how much other stuff that's out there to read and engage with. It's so good. We live in a golden age of television. You know, I just ordered the Man Book a long list. I mean, there's just there's so much beautiful stuff out there that it's, you know, George has given me a lot and it's it's fine. It's OK. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm at peace. I'm not happy, but I'm at peace. It's okay. I mean, honestly, if another book came out, that's just a year of my life gone. Do it. I mean, this is a controversial thing for the fandom. Do do any of us actually want the next book? Do any do any of us have the energy for the next book? Well, I still oh, want I... it. And if it's <laughs> Am I just talking shit? Am I talking utter nonsense? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even I'm want the book. You're gonna, take... you're gonna go crazy when it's done. I want the book. Of course, I'm just talking nonsense. But it's one of those psychological <laughs> things you do to yourself. Like I don't even need the book. I have a full life. I'm happy. This is how I used to like people. I'm saying I don't need a boyfriend to make my life complete. You know. <laughs> Oh god, the whole thing's crazy is, balls. I it's been so long since like we've had forward movement and Sansa's the story that like I'm I need I need more. I actually don't need more for myself. This is going to sound so self-serving. I actually I want another book for the community because I do really worry about what happens to the fans and more widely involved more specifically if it isn't another book. Um Yeah. 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 I'm 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 hoping that the um that Fire and Blood will be fun to read. That's like that's what I'm hoping for. I'm not hoping that it's like book level or anything. I'm just hoping that it's like an enjoyable narrative style story. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. exactly. I want more I want more than what we had in World of Ice Fire. I want a lot yeah. more. <laughs> like I don't want more dry history, you know, like George can write history in a really fascinating way or he can write it in like the rogue prince kind of way, which is just like and then this happened. Blah, blah, and then blah, this blah, happened. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I'm like I'm not into that. I mean Princess and the Queen was really enjoyable. Yeah. I mean that had dialogue that had like mystery of like we don't really know what happened and like you get this from this dwarf named Mushroom. (laughs) I just feel like George needs to get real like stop referring to your work as a Silmarillion. The people reason people go back to that is because they still have a completed uh, text which is Lord of the Rings and then everything else like flows from that and enriches it. But if you don't finish your main actual set of books 
in in 50 years time no one's going to give a shit about viral blood i promise you yeah it's true she says exactly. bitterly and meanly <laughs> i mean i'm sure they will well, <laughs> and and god bless you george but uh, oh yeah i'm but, not reading just that on the, like just on the on the practical level i like i don't think this coming out because george is like i'm really happy with the way this is you know i think it's coming out because his publishers are like holiday Beating him up. coming yeah. up so we want something with george r martin's name on it you know to publish and he was like well i have this and probably to get paid at this yeah. point he, you know Agree. Yeah, I think he's and lost the publishers his publishers are just grasping at draws now. Yeah. I don't they think he wants to finish. To he needs to just. All I need from George, who's given me so much, so he doesn't owe me anything. All I need from him is the self awareness and the compassion to say, you know what? I'm bored by this now. I don't want to finish it. And that's okay because it's 20 years later. And I'm going to hand it over to another author with my complete notes and thoughts on how I want it to finish and let them fill it in for my readers. That's, yeah. all, that's what I need from him. Yeah, I'd like that too. Are you guys T-Wow preview chaptering? Actually, some people, oh, listening, yeah. some people listening to this won't yeah, be. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to put this in the after show, guys, so you can carry on listening. Do not listen to the after show, um, or I will clearly signpost it in the after show um, and in the show notes. So I just feel that Euron in the in the T-Wow chapter just comes across as so evil and brilliant, and in the show just doesn't live up to that. So that was a bit disappointing, but that's okay. They're not going to introduce a sort of like final act evil villain of that magnitude. So I, I get that, but it was still just a bit like meh, okay this year on almost you seems like a more real character oh yeah like because oh, like book you yeah. is something out of like cthulhu right <laughs> it's, it's bonkers. Exactly. quite exactly. literally yeah yeah and and this person's motivation seems to make more sense than this one yeah uh, he's so not far. killing it gods is. he just wants to sleep with cersei yeah exactly yeah he wants he wants control over the the iron throne basically that's really good yeah i mean good on him for trying right yeah <laughs> yeah going to fray why not <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Throw your cat in the ring. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing would be like how that plays with Theon and Yara because, you know, I, I, I'm not sure where they're going with that because they, they have definitely emphasized that, that Euron is a sadist even though they haven't focused on it as much. But like... I don't know. I like Yara. That that also kind of bleeds over from my very intense love of Asha and the books. Um, so I, I'm I don't know. I'm I'm nervous about that. She's also like she is a cool actress and a character, and she gets some of the funnier lines. There's a great um, yeah. bit of dialogue I wrote down here. Danny, I assume your ships don't come with a demand of marriage. Yara, well, I never make demands, but I'm up for anything really. <laughs> yes, I ship them. <laughs> The other, the other, the other bit of dialogue I wrote down is from uh, Sansa and Littlefinger. Littlefinger, what do you want that you do not have? Sansa, at the moment, peace and quiet. Don't try to always have the last word. Let's just assume it's something clever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how do you not love Sansa? Yeah, that was awesome. 